go. Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Jeffrey Hanna at Atlas Health. Hope you are doing well today. And welcome again to another edition of The Big Idea. What is The Big Idea? It's where we're going to be talking about some relatively complicated kind of stuff, but trying to give you the big idea, the big picture in terms of what's going on, looking at some important research, but how this is very important to you in terms of dealing with your own health issues, but also for, you know, healthcare practitioners who otherwise may not be avail or aware of this particular kind of information. And so what we're going to be looking at today, rather than focusing on a, a specific condition or anything like that, we need to talk a little bit about how your body works and what happens when there is an issue with the plumbing system. Now, plumbing in the body, what we're actually referring to is we are referring to blood flow. And blood flow is going to be a factor of arteries supplying blood to things, veins draining that blood away, and then how that fluid ultimately circulates in the system. And our focus is going to be, of course, what's going on in this area, right up in the very top as it relates to the interface between the neck and the brain. Because if there's a disruption in that particular area, that can cause all kinds of different symptoms. So I hope that you're going to enjoy this video here as always. And if I've piqued your interest here, I ask you, you know, in advance, if you can make sure that you will uh, like the video here, but also hit the subscribe button. So that way you're a getting, you know, these updates as we're putting these videos out here, but then B, it also helps with the computer algorithms so that that way these kinds of videos and this information is going to get out there to the people who otherwise need to be able to find it. So what are we going to do here? We're going to go back to 2004, simpler times. Human cerebral venous outflow pathway depends on posture and central venous pressure. So as always, let's go ahead and rip through the abstract really quick and then break down and explain to you what it means. Here we go. Internal jugular veins are the major cerebral venous outflow pathway in supine humans. and upright humans, the positioning of these veins above heart level causes them to collapse. An alternative Cerebral outflow pathway is the vertebral venous plexus. We set out to determine if the effect of posture and central venous pressure on the distribution of cerebral outflow over the internal jugular veins and the vertebral um, plexus. The model, consisting of two jugular veins, each a chain of 10 units, containing nonlinear resistances and capacitors, and vertebral veins plexus containing a resistance, showed blood flow mainly through the internal jugular veins in the supine position, but mainly through the vertebral venous plexus in the upright position of Valsalva's maneuver, while standing completely reopened the jugular veins. The results suggest that the cerebral venous flow distribution depends on posture and central venous pressure. In supine humans, the internal jugular veins are the primary pathway. The internal jugular veins are collapsed in the standing position and blood is shunted to an alternative venous pathway, but a marked increase in central venous pressure when standing completely reopens the jugular veins. Okay, what does this actually mean? It means... Firstly, in terms of how blood, well, let's talk about what they don't talk about. How does blood go up to your brain? Well, it's going to go from your heart, and then it's going to take one of two pathways. The first one is what's called the internal carotid, it's actually just common carotid arteries at this point, but they come up the front of the neck, they go like this, they become what is called the internal carotid artery, and it goes up and supplies basically two-thirds of all the blood, particularly to your pituitary gland, your hypothalamus, and all of the major frontal parts of your brain. You also have what are called vertebral arteries. These also come from the heart, and these actually transmit through the vertebrae in your neck, up the back, loop around the very top, it's called the atlas and the axis vertebra, and they supply essentially a third of all the blood to the brain, but then that's essentially all of the blood to the back portions, your balance centers, and also to your brain stem, which is the major survival and uh, coordination control centers for all of the organs and all the functions in your body. So that's how you get blood to the system. Well, how do you get blood from the system? Well, to drain blood back from the brain after it's been used back to the heart, two principal pathways. The first one are the internal jugular veins. Very, very big structures. They're going to come from here along the front of your neck like that, draining blood ultimately back to the heart. 
The other set are what are called the vertebral veins. And what these are is these follow the exact same course as the vertebral arteries, but in reverse. They drain blood out of the base of the skull, so right across to the back here, through the vertebra, so through the C1, through the C2, C down to about the C6, and then ultimately drain in with other, um, other branches back to the heart. Now, this is a very interesting kind of arrangement, and again, not trying to bore you to tears and all of this sort of stuff, but veins and arteries are not actually constructed the same. So when you consider, you know, your heart being a major muscular pump, when it expels blood either upwards or downwards, it does so with pressure. And so as a result, it means that arterial walls need to be very, very thick to be able to withstand that pressure. Venous blood, when it's being drained back to the heart, on the other hand, is done so more by um, passive processes or by simple pressure gradients. And so what that means, for example, is if you are upstanding, blood is going to be draining back from your brain to your heart simply by the force of gravity. When it's down in your legs, it actually has to be moved up through your normal muscular action. And this is one of the reasons why if a person, for example, is sitting in an airplane for a long period of time, not moving, the concern is that blood will pool, that it won't normally be moving as if a person was fidgeting, moving their legs, standing, walking, all that sort of stuff, back to the heart, and that can be associated with the clot. But we're not actually here to talk about that kind of thing. So these two major pathways, we have to simply understand that from the brain, it's going to be gravity that allows for the blood to come back through the system. Now, here is the interesting thing. It's that it doesn't occur equally between these two venous drainage systems. And this was found long, long time back that basically when a person is in a lying down position, Simple gravity, the system is open, the veins are open, you've got nice, even drainage from the brain back to the heart by and large. And in this case, it's going to be the internal jugular veins, the ones in the front, they are going to be the ones who are able to do the vast majority of all the drainage. Why? Because they're very, very big. The vertebral veins then, relative collaterals, Accessory drainage is still very important, but quite very secondary. However, when you sit up, when you stand up, when you go into the upright position, the pressure of gravity and the muscles on the front of your throat actually causes a constriction or a narrowing of the internal jugular veins. And what that means is it means that these are not near as open as they were before to be able to drain blood from the brain back to your heart. And so the priority switches. And it means that the vertebral veins are actually the ones that are going to be responsible for draining blood from the back of your head, from your brain to your heart when you are in an upright position. And I repeat, these things are not near as big and they're going to be transmitting through the upper vertebrae in your neck. And I'm going to get to that a little bit later in terms of why that is potentially clinically significant for any number of different conditions. But let's just walk you through in terms of what the research here actually says. So now that I've given you a bit of the layout here, what they wanted to do in this particular study is they wanted to study if this, you know, basically this belief, this hypothesis was um, genuine. So what they did was they compared using, um, I think it was like a, a little electrical device of some kind to measure current flows because, you know, a change in fluid, you can detect electrical changes and that's how they're determining, okay, how are there changes going on in these different areas. And then they also used ultrasound to see what would happen uh, to blood flow through these different areas when a person was in either an upright or in a lying down position. They also mentioned something that's called a Valsalva maneuver. And what's a Valsalva maneuver? It is anything that increases pressure inside of the head um, out into the body. And so classic example, let's say that your ears are blocked and you squeeze like that to try to get the ears to pop or something like that. That would be an example of a Valsalva maneuver. Another example would be if you are coughing, 
not going to do that into the microphone. Or if you sneeze, Hurch. imagine if you would anything where you've got a wretched hangover that is potentially then if you move your head or your neck or your body in that way, it just, oh, my head. That's essentially a Valsalva maneuver, anything that increases the pressure. The same thing is also true then of forcefully expelling air. What that does is it increases the normal pressure inside of the skull, and that then has an impact on the uh, veins as well. So what the researchers said is, okay, we want to compare blood flow in an upright position. We want to see what happens with blood flow in a down position. And we also want to see what the action of employing this kind of a or pressure Valsalva manure does in terms of opening or closing those particular um, those particular structures. Whoops, pushed the wrong button there. Sorry, that's what happens. Okay, so what they did was they did all of that experiment. That's what they are walking through, basically all of this sort of stuff right here. They had to make a couple of assumptions. Number one is that brain flow out of the brain is assumed to be equal to the blood flow going in. Um, and again, this will have a little bit of a clinical significance when I talk about this in just a wee little bit. Um, so they said, knowing that the jugular veins to be collapsed in the upright position reopened during the positive pressure breathing, we hypothesize, we believe that cerebral outflow pathway will be dependent on posture. And they think that there's also going to be a change when doing that bearing down kind of action. And so this is them walking through all of that sort of stuff. This is quite very, very technical in terms of the uh, the details and all that sort of stuff, which is, again, why we just want to give you the big idea. And this, I'll actually skip ahead just a wee little bit here, to this, this picture right here, because this picture um, illustrates really, really well what I had already uh, talked about here. So when you are lying down, the belief is that it's going to be this big vein on the front of your neck that is doing the principal amount of the drainage. And when you are in the upright position, it's this smaller one that follows a little bit more of a ziggly course um, as it's going back from your brain to your heart. This is pretty much exactly what they found is going on. So they found that when a person was in the up, supine, you need to know what that word is. Supine means lying on your back. So face up, lying on your back. So they found that when a person was lying principally on their back, vast majority of the drainage was through these internal jugular veins, and only a tiny amount, relatively speaking, was through those back vertebral veins. What they found is they found that if a person then did this, did the pressure, did the bearing down and all that sort of stuff, that those stayed open. Then what they did was they found that when you take a person and go into the upright position, that it's going to be these collapsing and the principal amount of drainage is going to be coming out through the back. Okay, that's pretty much what we expected to find. But what they also found is that if you do that, Valsalva, that pressure kind of maneuver, that what would actually happen is for that split second, for that moment, it would actually open the internal jugular veins here in the front, and you could get a little bit of the additional drainage coming out in that direction. Pretty cool stuff is kind of interesting. Now, they also had to make another limitation just in terms of their discussion of things right here. And it's that the vertebral venous plexus is rudimentary in our body, consists of single non-varying resistance. What are they actually referring to here? You know, you can pull open any anatomy textbook or something like that. And okay, we get the idea. There's a heart, there's a brain, and then there's gonna be these major roads or basically plumbing pipes, if you would, to the brain from the brain. And that's good, and that's the same in everybody, right? Well, generally the same, yes. However, there's all kinds of different variations. And especially the architecture of the veins that are orientated and located across the base of your skull and that assist with blood drainage from your brain stem through those vertebral arteries is extraordinarily variable. It's more like a network of things that is really going to be different in everyone. We understand its architecture structure. Yeah, there might still be some general forms and all that sort of stuff, but it is really, really all over the shop. The point is, is they acknowledge that as a potential limitation in terms of their ability to measure the, um, the blood flow and all of this sort of stuff. So in going through this 
paper here, you might be wondering, it's like, okay, you know, he's talking about all of this anatomy stuff. Now, that's cool if you might be an anatomy geek or something like that, but really, so what? What, what does this actually mean in terms of my health and well-being? It's like, okay, I want you to perceive now the possibility of what happens if something is blocking either your internal jugular vein or your vertebral vein. So normally what we're saying is that in these different positions, that drainage pathway needs to be open. And that I want you to imagine if something is narrowing, constricting, occluding that normal drainage pathway in any way, what is that going to do to your normal physiology? So let's start first with the idea of the internal jugular veins, okay? Let's say that you have something that is physically blocking the internal jugular vein drainage system. What this means is it means that you are more likely going to notice a problem when you are in a lying down position. Or if you do that kind of a movement and the normal amount of blood flow is not able to drain out of that system in the way that it's supposed to, that is going to lead to what's called an insufficiency. In other words, coming back to that prevailing belief that the amount of blood flow going up is equal to the amount of blood flow going back down. What if the amount of blood flow going back down from your brain to your heart is not enough? It's insufficient. Why? Because something is blocking the normal drainage pathways like you've got something clogged in your pipes. So if you've got something with the internal jugular vein blocked up, Okay, that's going to be a principal issue usually when you are lying down on your back, something like that. So, what is a person going to feel? They're going to feel increase of pressure when they are lying down on their back. And how do you identify these things? You can have ultrasounds, you can have uh, Doppler studies, which is kind of ultrasound. Um, you can have, uh, they're called uh, venographs or MRVs, so a specialized kind of a MRI that looks at uh, blood flow. And what you can actually see is, ooh, there's a physical blockage. There's something that is not, you know, moving in that way that it should be. And if this is the case, this is where oftentimes people need, um, you know, venous therapy or shunts or different kinds of things to open that back up. And usually they say all this pressure that was building up, wow, that just goes away. Really, really good, really cool stuff. And that's if the process is occurring with the internal jugular vein. But that, I would have to say, at least in my own experience, is relatively rare. I want instead now to flip it around and look at the other side of the equation. This one, I believe, is actually far more common in my own observation. So what did we say about vertebral veins? Vertebral veins are the primary drainage pathway when you are in an upright position. And so... If when you are in an upright position, the principal amount of drainage needs to be going through those vertebral veins, but it isn't for some reason, what's going to happen? The pressure is going to start to build up. Where is it going to build up? Inside of your head, behind your eyes, across the base of your skull, right through here. And it's going to feel ugh, really yucky, really nasty, and all this sort of stuff. But if you then do something that switches so that it's going to engage the internal jugular veins, presuming no blockages there, such as deep exhalation breathing, relaxation exercises, and lying down. Then vertebral veins, whether they're blocked or not, it's not going to matter as much because the internal jugular veins will open the way that they're supposed to, and then you're going to have that drainage. So that insufficiency that was getting dammed up here can ultimately come out of the system. So when you feel better, when you lie down, especially if you feel like you've got pressure across the base of your skull, if you feel like you have brain fog, if you feel like you have a heavy head sensation, if you feel like there's pressure behind your eyes, all of these are descriptors which, based on our understanding about fluid dynamics in the brain, is a sign, or a symptom more appropriately, that you're having an issue that very likely could involve drainage through the vertebral veins. Okay, so what do we do about this? Well, you know, 
can we do shunting and all that sort of stuff? Well, maybe not me, because I'm not a, a neurovascular surgeon, um, but we've got a few problems if this is the, uh, the case here. So number one, internal jugular veins, though located on the front, pretty easy to get to. And you can get into the veins, you know, through the neck and all that sort of stuff by basically having a, a shunt put in through a distal vein in your arm and your leg or something like that. Um, but shall we come back to our little discussion about vertebral veins and that they are not consistent in their architecture? In other words, it is much more difficult to pinpoint and to say by doing specific venous flow studies of the venous uh, vertebral veins and the uh, venous plexus to say this is exactly where the, the blockage or the lesion or something is. Really, really hard to pinpoint. Now, in addition to that, because this is, of course, going to be, you know, falling into my area of expertise and where I'm able to help people when we talk about mechanical disorders in the alignment of their upper neck. What does that mean? That means you've had a physical injury to your neck, didn't break, didn't dislocate, and there maybe wasn't even any bleeding or broken bones. But what it did was it caused those upper vertebrae to shift off their, uh, excuse me, off their neutral center of gravity. Even a couple of millimeters would be enough. And there it's been sitting, meaning that your basically head is not sitting properly on your neck, something like this. And if that has been able to accumulate over a long enough period of time, five years, 10 years, 20 years, something like that, you've slowly had the accumulation of stuff building up with the potential to cause problems. And a lot of times people say, oh, it's because you're getting older and all this sort of stuff. That is not necessarily so. It could very well be instead that you've actually had a mechanical issue with the alignment of your upper neck, say either you're either your atlas or your axis. And as the consequence of that, that is what is actually producing the issue. And what did we say about vertebral veins? I said that they go through the atlas and the axis. So if that vertebra has actually shifted, what that can do, very much the equivalent of putting pressure around your finger, not enough to where it's going to go immediately black and blue, but even get a rubber band or something like that and just put even that little, little bit of pressure. You probably will start to feel that accumulate. Can't see it on the camera there because I was off just a little bit. You'll start to feel it accumulate just that little bit even after even a few minutes. In other words, it doesn't take that much pressure to impede the normal flow of the vertebral veins or any of these associated little veins that are in that plexus and in that particular area. And so if you have this mechanical misalignment that is restricting how blood is going to be able to flow from your uh, brain back to your heart, it's going to be most evident when you are in an upright position when that is the preferred drainage pathway. And guess what? When you lie down, that's not going to fix that misalignment. It's not going to go away. However, when you lie down, because your body is able to use that bypass mechanism through your internal jugular veins, that's going to allow for that drainage to move through. And this is one of the reasons why then we believe and why it's a very, very common sign of a more serious issue involving the alignment of a person's neck, that if you lie down and you feel better, and less pressure and less fogginess and all that sort of stuff. And it feels worse the longer that you are upright. Why it is a major indication that there is something actually not right with the alignment of your neck. And it's probably involving this vertebral venous drainage system. Now, there's actually been done quite a lot of research on this, uh, on this topic. And I just wanted to show you this particular study as a, a bit of a contrast to um, what we were saying here before, just to illustrate that, okay, there is not a true 100% operational consensus. So these guys here, they did a study 2014. So again, this one here, it's better part of about 10 years old now. And they're looking at it in particular as it relates to MS, multiple sclerosis. And it's because there's what's called the chronic cerebral spinal venous insufficiency hypothesis. What it is, is it's a hypothesis that certain kinds of multiple sclerosis are brought about because you have a mechanical disorder in the back of the neck here that is impeding the normal drainage of blood, throw, uh, blood flow through those vertebral veins in the system and all that sort of stuff. So what these guys say right from the bat, the hypothesis that multiple sclerosis could be provoked by a derangement of the blood 
outflow from the brain has been largely discredited in part because data on the normal pattern of outflow are scarce and obtained with different methods. Well, I got a bit of an issue with that right there. That is called uh, an appeal to ignorance. Um, not, you know, a knock against the authors and all that sort of stuff, but what that simply means is it means that, oh, there's not any evidence to support something, therefore it's not true. Well, what it means is it means that we need better quality evidence. They're saying that based on, you know, people who are coming up with these hypotheses and these ideas, they say they have very divergent kinds of uh, methodologies to support that, and so, no, we, we don't think that that's real. You know, I would quite disagree with that. I would say that, you know, we need better ways of studying that, and I'll come back around this, uh, back around here. But they say, nevertheless, the aim of the study is to evaluate normal pattern of outflow for the vertebral and internal jugular veins in healthy subjects using Doppler ultrasound. So, in the sitting position, flow decreases both in the vertebral veins and internal jugular veins as the total vessel area decreases even if the mean velocity increases. What does this mean? It means that these guys are actually finding something that the other researchers didn't. They find that it's not just a matter of sit up, or excuse me, lie down, internal jugular vein big, sit up, internal jugular vein go small, and vertebral vein stays as open. What they find is they find that both of them actually do decrease a little bit. And that does make sense, because what we said is we said, okay, if veins collapse under pressure, well, whether they're the internal jugular veins or whether they are the vertebral veins, if you're in the upright position, they're both still veins, and you're both still subject to gravity in the same kind of orientation. So yeah, it does make sense that you know they would both come down a little bit. But here's the kicker. This is what they found. Contrary to what happens to blood inflow, outflow in the supine position through vertebral and internal jugular veins is more than twice the outflow in the sitting position. What that means is it means that blood inflow, even though it's going to be even when you're going in the um, in any position and all that sort of stuff, it means that when you are, or excuse me, more appropriately, what it means is it means the amount of collapse of, say, the internal jugular veins versus the vertebral veins, the internal jugular veins collapse a lot more in proportion to the size of the vertebral vein. And that's the reason why, even though, again, I'm trying to do this with my hands as best as I can in front of the camera there. So let's say internal jugular vein here, vertebral vein here. The internal jugular vein collapses an awful lot more. The vertebral vein it collapses, but still not quite as much as the other side over here. That's the reason why it's draining. But what they also found is they found that when you take the amount of constriction of both of those, that that is actually not sufficient in and of itself in order for blood to properly drain out of the system. In other words, if you're in an upright position and you're draining principally for vertebral veins, vertebral veins by themselves actually cannot account for all of the blood that needs to be drained out of your system. And so what these guys hypothesize is that they, our results support the view that other outflow pathways, such as the vertebral plexus, that network of veins right through the back of your skull play a major role in the normal physiology of brain circulation and must be assessed in order to obtain a complete picture of blood outflow. In other words, if blood cannot drain properly from the brain, what it may do is it may actually spill over and or collateralize in these veins across the very base of your skull. And what's that going to feel like? Again, if there is a drainage flow issue or something like that, pressure across the back of the head, pulling through the back of the muscles through here, sometimes what are called these summertime headaches. You know, if you can feel that there's a thunderstorm coming and just, oh, I'm getting a headache right across the base right here. Well, guess what? That's where all those veins are. And if they swell that little bit and they develop that neurosensitivity, that can bring on a headache. That can also bring on a... Um, uh, vestibular issue, dizziness, vertigo, something like that. It's actually uh, hypothesized to be associated with um, cervicogenic dizziness and also something called a Meniere's syndrome, which is a different article that we might look at uh, some other time. Uh, in other words, you can have a lot of different conditions associated when you are not having normal drainage uh, from your brain. And again, what we're hypothesizing from the, you know, 
flare technique from the chiropractic perspective is that if you've got this issue with the mechanical alignment in the neck, that is going to be one of the major things that is affecting the way that blood can actually drain from your head back to your heart and that it will be most pronounced when you are in the upright versus lying down position because that is when that pathway is actually being required to be used the very most. So what are they saying? We've shown that blood flow, BF, in both venous systems, internal jugular vein and vertebral veins, is significantly reduced when you go from sitting or from supine to sitting, confirming data from other studies. And because arterial blood flow passing from the um, um, lying down to the upright position is only slightly reduced, if not increased, it means that there must be additional drainage pathways and very likely it's going to involve this network of different uh, veins that are associated through the very back of the head. So we've given you a few little considerations in this particular little talk here, but I wanted to take it just the one step further. And again, this gets more into the hypothesis world. We have to take, okay, this is the, you know, the data that we have received, but then how do we make sense of this and how can we use that data to fill in some of the blanks saying, you know, we don't have everything figured out, but you know, if A, then B, and if B, then C, where it's not making broad overgeneralizations or leaping too far, but we're able to take the data and use it to support, you know, other hypotheses so that we can do things to actually help people out. So we've said if people have these different kinds of drainage issues, and if it's related to the neck, then by correcting the neck, at least in theory, if it can help with the drainage outflow, then it should also help with reducing the pressure and reducing some of the other associated symptoms. So what are some of those symptoms? Well, I had mentioned headaches, I would mentioned balance, I mentioned pressure, I mentioned really anything that feels better when you lie down. However, and this, you know, I'll probably do another completely separate video on this one. Uh, there is a chiropractic researcher some years ago, his name is Michael Flanagan, and he wrote a book and published a paper, it was called The Downside of Upright Posture. And in brief, what he is describing, or A, the mechanics of what I've described in terms of how fluid actually does drain from the brain, and what the choke point potentially is of the atlas and the axis. And he said that if you have this accumulation of back built up pressure, this can ultimately then lead to poor circulation within the brain itself because you're not going to be able to get the normal byproducts, metabolic waste, all that sort of stuff to flow out of the system. And this, over a long enough period of time, could even manifest in neurodegenerative conditions such as certain forms of dementia, certain forms of Parkinsonism, and certain forms of multiple sclerosis on top of any number of additional kinds of health considerations, including idiopathic intracranial hypertension, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, brain fog, a heavy sensation through the head, pain, tiredness, fatigue behind the eyes, and then any number of myofascial uh, pain syndromes involving the face, the neck, the back of the head, any of that sort of stuff. Now, does this mean that all cases of these conditions are the result of the neck being out of alignment? Uh, absolutely not. And it's because there are multiple different ways that our you know, nerves can ultimately be injured, impacted, and all this sort of stuff. But nevertheless, what this you know, hypothesis illustrates for us is what is potentially one very important missing piece in the puzzle. That if your neck is not properly aligned, it's going to, or at least has the potential to affect the way that fluid is going to be able to drain, drain from your brain, brain. If your brain is not draining fluid properly, it can lead to a backup. And if it leads to a backup, that can cause any number of different issues. In other words, then, this idea, this concept that we wanted to give you in the very beginning here, that I feel better when I lie down, I feel worse when I am standing up, could be a sign of a more serious problem. And that if it can be corrected in a non-surgical, non-drug, in an independent, in a precise, in a gentle, in a personalized way, 
based on your individual needs, that it may be able to help you with any number of different, you know, health conditions that are going on that would be related to that particular kind of issue. That is what the big takeaway that I wanted to give you in this particular article is. I repeat, if you're having issues where lying down feels better, sitting up for a long time feels not so good, check the upper neck because it could be related to some other stuff that otherwise you may never have even thought of. So, I think that we've punished you guys with quite enough uh, information there right now in those uh, two little articles, two little articles, two big articles, but I do hope that uh, you've enjoyed the video here. Um, again, I ask you that, you know, if you have enjoyed this one, if you found value in it, A, please do like it and or subscribe to the channel here just by clicking the, the little button again. What that does is that helps get this video available for other people who need to find this information. Second to that is if you have found uh, value in this one here and you've recognized, huh, this is uh, important and for somebody else important in your life, please do share this video with them. And then number three is if this message resonates for you and you want to know, it's like, okay, you know, what can be done to help these different kinds of things? What we'd have you do is we'd have you go to our own website, which is atlashealth.com.au, where you can find any number of other, you know, information about um, conditions that are related to the upper neck, what we do in our practice, how we may be able to help you, family members, etc., so that you can, you know, be getting back and enjoying the best quality of life that you possibly can. So those are your three bits of homework and all of that sort of stuff. As always, I appreciate your time and attention with this um, and do hope that you found it not just um, informative, um, but also valuable and then, you know, not too boring or uh, somewhat entertaining as we went along here too. So anyway, take care and we will see you on the next time. Bye-bye, everybody.